And every year it gets to be a little more people, a little more people understand about the microbiome. And now it's getting to the point where the idea of the microbiome and gut health um, is almost becoming like a national conversation. It's becoming sort of front page news. Um, I talked about this kind of stuff that I'm going to talk to you guys about tonight in a little more detail on, um, on one of the local uh, television stations this morning. And so I went there, I did my little thing about eating the right kinds of fiber and eating the right kinds of fermented foods and eating the right kinds of phytonutrients and brightly colored fruits and vegetables and things like that. So we did our segment and it was maybe, you know, typical morning TV segment, you know, three or four minutes and got my bullet points in. And I must have stayed there for 30 or 40 minutes afterwards, just answering gut health questions for the, for the crew, you know, because they're, they're really interested in this. So it, it really is becoming, you know, an area that a lot of people are delving into more. Does anyone know why? Does anyone know why we're hearing so much about the microbiome now, whereas we, we, we didn't hear about it hardly at all five years ago? Does anyone know why that is? It's not like we just discovered there were bacteria in our guts, right? We've known that for hundreds and hundreds of years. And in fact, a hundred years ago, we knew that people who had better microbiomes, people who ate more fermented foods, people who ate yogurt and, and sauerkraut and things like that, um, did better. They, they didn't get as sick as often. They didn't get as many diseases. They, they lived longer. We knew that kind of thing a hundred years ago. But we're learning a lot more about it right now. It's not just about hey, there's bacteria in the gut. And it's not just about, hey, any old yogurt is gonna, is gonna do, these, do these benefits for you. Well, we know now because of genetic techniques, because we can actually go in and measure, not just if there are bacteria there, but which bacteria there are there. You know, what strains of bacteria there? What are the good guys? What are the bad guys? We know with, with, with very good precision, what happens when you eat this fiber? What happens when you eat this Big Mac, you know, we can see what happens to the bacterial profile and importantly, what compounds they start to produce, which is why I'm going to talk tonight about mental wellness. Um, what we're learning is that the majority of how we feel, our depression, our anxiety, our stress, our ability to focus or not, our ability to remember or not, um, our motivation, our appetite, our cravings, a lot of these things that we view as mental wellness issues aren't really just brain issues, they're gut-brain issues. And so much so that we, that we talk about this, the gut, as a second brain. So just, just quick show of hands, a lot of people said they know about the microbiome. How many people have heard of the concept of two brains, that we have two brains in our bodies? Right, so may, maybe 10% of the hands went up, right? So the other 90% of you are probably sitting there thinking, two brains? I know people who don't have one brain, right? So, so what, what, what we want people to understand is that 90% of the serotonin, your, your neurotransmitter of sort of being happy, 90% of that's made in your gut and has its signaling effects in your brain. 70% of your dopamine is made in your gut. That's the neurotransmitter of sort of being motivated. Most of your norepinephrine, which helps with focus. Most of your GABA, which helps with, with relaxation. Those kinds of things are in the gut. So when we talk to people about mental wellness, what we want people to realize is that a lot of how you feel here in your first brain, in your brain in your head, is determined by what happens in your second brain, what's happening in your microbiome and your gut. And those two brains need to talk to each other so you can get yourself, no matter where you are on this, which is what I call the mental wellness continuum, no matter where you are on that, you can benefit from this kind of stuff that I'm going to talk about tonight, which is how do I change my microbiome? How do I improve my gut integrity? How do I get the signals that start in the gut? How do I get them to emanate to the right places in the body so I have the right signaling effects? Because you can have somebody who's way down here in this sort of you know, low end of the mental wellness continuum, and people here quite literally don't know what the next move is, right? They feel... A, they exhibit something that we call sickness behavior, where your neurotransmitters and your biology is, is literally leading you to want to do this, to kind of curl up and not go out, not connect with other people, not look for a solution, and just wait, right? That's sickness behavior. You're not out there searching for a solution. You're waiting for the solution to find you or for, the, or for whatever is out of balance in your body to rebalance. And unfortunately, the things that cause us to be out of balance 
our poor diet, our lack of sleep, our environmental exposure, our stress levels, all those sorts of things, they're not gonna change themselves, right? So we have to encourage people who are here to, to, to actively look for those kinds of solutions because if we can take you from here to feeling normal again, that's a huge win for that person. Most people are here. They're sort of in this typical zone. It's not, you notice I don't say normal, right? It's not a normal situation for someone to feel tired during the day and restless and tense at night. That's not a normal situation, but it's typical. It's how most people feel these days. And people who are here will end up chalking it up to, well, you know, yikes. Well, you know, I, I, I guess I'm just not eating the right diet. I guess maybe I'm just a little older. Maybe I'm, uh, you know, maybe I have a lot of stress in my life. Maybe my job, maybe my spouse, maybe whatever that's causing stress in my life. And we chalk it up to those sorts of things and say, well, I guess I'm supposed to feel this way. I'm here to tell you, you're not supposed to feel that way. You're supposed to be up here in this optimized job. So we can take people who are here and get them to feel as good as they've ever felt in their entire life. And we can take people who are here in this optimized zone. I was talking to a couple of athletes beforehand. If you're, if you're, let's say you're a nine, right? On a scale of one to 10, you get somebody who's a nine, where do you think that person wants to be? They wanna be a 9.1 or a 9.2, or, or if, you're, if you're an athlete, I've done a lot of work in a lot of training centers and places like that. You get a lot of people there who are a 9.9, .9, and they want to be a 10 or they want to be a 13. So they have a sort of an unfair advantage over all of their competition. And you know, if I were, if I were giving this same lecture at the Olympic Training Center, I would be telling you the exact same principles that I'm going to tell you throughout the next hour or so, which is we can get you from feeling 9.1 to 9.5 to 9.7 to 13 and to really optimize where you are. We refer to that as something called psychological vigor. And it's the thing that I've been studying for the last 20 years. So here's all the blah and blah about me. Um, I put this up here for two reasons, because I'm a, I'm a nutritional biochemist. That's what my PhD is in. So I like to talk a lot about how a particular intervention, a, a dietary change, an exercise change, a supplement regimen, whatever the case may be, how that changes your biochemistry, your cortisol levels, or your neurotransmitters, or your level of inflammation, whatever the biochemical pathway is, but then how that changes your psychology. How does that stress hormone make you feel in terms of your stress resilience? How does a neurotransmitter change your mood? How does a, 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 an inflammatory cytokine change your pain levels? Those sorts of things. Um, and I also want to remind you that these slides that I'm using right now are already posted at e either of these two websites. They're, they're, they're definitely at seancalvert.com right now. And we're also filming this, and we're going to put this up on YouTube afterwards. So that link will also be at SeanPelvin.com. So, you know, sometimes people try to take pictures of the slides, and, and you're totally welcome to continue doing that, man. Um, but the actual slides are posted there for you guys to use. Okay, so whenever I start off with this, I, I really like to let people know how big a problem this really is in the world. And I'm not going to go through all these little bullet points for you, but I want you to realize that this is quite literally hundreds of millions of people in the United States alone that are spending hundreds of billions of dollars to take yourself from somewhere on that mental wellness continuum to, to feeling better, right? So, so lots of people are spending lots of money on lots of fairly inadequate ways of, of changing how we feel. Um, and, and, and there's lots of people who are in that boat. And it's, 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 it's older, it's younger, it's, it's across every socioeconomic class. Uh, the World Health Organization calls this, what I'm talking about tonight, the health epidemic of the 21st century. It's a big, big problem in the world. But it's been a big problem for a long time. I've been giving these kinds of lectures for, like I said earlier, 20 years. And sometimes I would put up WHO statistics and I would show the biggest problems around the globe, health problems. And all the standard suspects were always there. Heart disease and obesity, diabetes and lung disease and you know, et cetera, et cetera, cancer. And these issues, but mental wellness issues, depression, anxiety, stress, were always sort of in the top 10 or five. And it, it, would, it would fluctuate from year to year. One year it would be number four, one year it would be number six. And we would always say to people, based on World Health Organization statistics, 
the, 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 the stress category is going to surpass all the others by 2030, right? We had the data. Big problem. It was progressively getting worse year by year by year. Um, and by 2030, it was going to be number one, outpacing all those other conditions. And what happened was last year, March of last year, it became number one. And so that tells us, yeah, we knew it was bad. We knew it was getting worse. But it got bad really, really quickly because of a lot of reasons, right? It could, it could, be, it could be financial stress. It could be you know, the stress of anything that's out there right now. But it's, a, but, it's a, but it's a big, big problem for a lot of people. And unfortunately, these are the kinds of things that we have access to to sort of treat those problems. If you're low on the mental wellness continuum, it's very likely you'll go to your doctor and say, hey doc, I feel terrible. I, sometimes people will say, I feel off. I feel like something is out of balance in my body. And your poor doctor doesn't have something that treats off, right? They don't have anything for that. There's nothing in their toolbox that, 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 that does the rebalancing effect that we really need. And so you get a Prozac or you get an Ambien or you get a Ritalin or you get whatever the case is, wherever you're off in your gut-brain axis, or, or we self-medicate with some of the things that you see up there, the monsters and the rock stars and the Starbucks and things like that. We spend $100 billion in this country alone every single year on this kind of stuff. And I'm not an anti-pharmaceutical kind of a person, but they, they have their niche of where they can be helpful, but they're mostly unhelpful for most people who get them. And it, I, I, I won't go into that right now, but we can talk about that afterwards. Um, they're not very effective for most of the people who get them because, and I don't think I have a specific slide for this, so I'm going to try to describe it this way. Most of the issues that these things are trying to treat, these mental wellness problems, are multifactorial problems. So, you know, if it were just, if it were just your serotonin that was causing you to be low on the, low, low serotonin, to be low on that mental wellness continuum, a drug like that might actually be beneficial for you. But most people who are low on that continuum have a problem with their serotonin, and then maybe their dopamine, and maybe their norepinephrine, and maybe their GABA, and maybe their cortisol, and maybe their inflammation, and maybe their gut integrity, and you can see it's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what you need to, to fix that multifactorial problem is a multifactorial solution. That's why something like an exercise regimen is more effective than any of those antidepressants or anti-anxieties in, in helping people feel better. That's why we can take a dietary intervention, like the Mediterranean diet, for example, that is multifactorial. It's giving you fiber, and it's giving you healthy fats, and it's giving you phytonutrients that have beneficial effects on all of those different biochemical pathways. So you can take somebody who has major depressive disorder, put them on a Mediterranean diet for eight weeks, and at the end of that eight weeks, they're no longer diagnosed with depression. Right, huge effects that we can get from things that are mildly effective, but in many, many different pathways at the same time. The analogy that I use sometimes is that drugs like this are sledgehammers. They're really powerful to do one thing, one chemical entity to work on one receptor site. And because of that power, they also have side effects. Whereas what I'm talking about, an exercise regimen, a supplement regimen, a dietary change, those are like a thousand fly swatters. Not any single one of those is as powerful as the sledgehammer, but sometimes you just need a little bit of tweaking and a little bit of rebalancing and a little bit of readjustment to get you to the place that you need to be, which is higher on that mental wellness continuum. Does that make sense to everybody? So um, one of the reasons that so many of us are in a situation like this is because of, because of stress. And not all stress is bad. When I talk about stress and when I write books about stress, one of the things that I really try to get across is that humans do really well with acute stress. We can adapt to that wonderfully well. In fact, in some cases, this is a little bit of stress that comes and goes and comes and goes. That's healthy for us. It's better to have a little bit of stress that keeps sort of fluctuating like that than no stress at all. Um, unfortunately, the kind of stress that most of us are exposed to are this, chronic stress. The kind of stress that comes and stays, sets up shop. It's the kind of stress that's in the back of your mind all the time. It's the kind of stress that gets your mind going as soon as your, your head hits the pillow at night. 
we don't do very well with that kind of stress. It, it, it becomes catabolic in the body, it breaks us down in a lot of really important ways. So when we study this, for someone like me, a scientist who focuses on this area, it is, it's wonderfully exciting because stress will affect all of these different body systems and that gives us lots of levers to push on. We can go into your hormone system and we can make changes there and you can see how it affects another area. We can see how it affects another area because all these chemical entities are flowing back and forth and talking to all these body systems. So it's really fun to play around in the system. If you're someone who's in this system and you're out of balance in your hormones and that's leading to problems in your immune system and that's leading to problems in your nervous system and that's leading you to be depressed, for example, it is, it is, it is phenomenally frustrating because you don't know which one of these to adjust first, right? And some of it is a chicken and egg scenario. If, you would, if, we, if you're out of balance here, it can cause an imbalance there, it can cause an imbalance there. But the cool part about it is that if you can restore balance here and maintain it, it will restore balance, it will restore balance. So you can get people out of this sort of downward cycle of worse and worse and worse and get them into a virtuous upward cycle where they're getting better and better and better. And I'm explaining how, how, how we do that, how we measure that in our trials. Uh, so stress sort of exhibits this, this, um, this, this inverted U-shaped curve where, like I, like I said just a minute ago, you want to have sort of the Goldilocks effect, right? You don't want too little, you don't want too much, you want to be sort of in that, in that sweet spot, in that just right area. Because when you're in that just right area, you're going to, have, you're going to be motivated. You're going to be energized. You're actually going to get signaling to make your immune system stronger. You're going to get signaling to make your neurons fire better and more efficiently. So all of that is good stuff. A little bit of stress here, going and coming, going and coming. But as soon as it gets chronic, that's where we sort of slip into the stress-related diseases. And how those end up manifesting themselves in a given person can be very, very different. You can have the same types of stressors, you can have the same types of disruption in the microbiome, and you can show people, here's your pattern, here's your pattern, here's your pattern, but person one might be fatigued, person two might be sad, person three might be tense, person four might be gaining belly fat all the time, and the difference between each one of those people who have the same sort of exposures and disruptions is what do you think? If they have the same problem, underlying problem, why would they all have the same symptoms? What do you guys think is going on? Why would those four people have completely different looking set of symptoms? Any idea? It's how their bodies are, like what their, what their resilience is. It's partly due to their bacteria. Their bacteria are sending signals to different parts of their body. So very importantly to their genes. Right, and all those four people probably have different genetic backgrounds. So one of the things that we're learning about the microbiome is that you get the right microbiome, it can send the right signals, you can have the right mood. You have the wrong microbiome, it can send the wrong signals, you can be low on that mental wellness continuum. But a lot of those signals coming from the microbiome are, are determining our genetic expression, which basically means what genes are turned on and what genes are turned off. And that kind of thing can, can determine our risk for diseases going out into the future. There are pharmaceutical companies now and biotech companies that have been formed around this idea of, can we get into the microbiome and modulate or manipulate it in a way to get the right signals to turn off the genes for Alzheimer's or the genes for Parkinson's or the genes for whatever, turn off the unhealthy genes and turn on the healthy genes. That's the kind of stuff that we're able to do with the microbiome like that. So I'm gonna give you a flavor for that as we go through here. So you wanna have, you wanna have this balance of a little bit of stress, what we call eustress. You don't wanna slip into distress, which can lead to burnout. Um, so you know, when we teach this to students, when we're talking about stress physiology in a classroom setting, we'll very often use this to, to, to describe a lot of what I just said about that mammals do well with acute stress not with chronic stress. And if anybody ever wants to get into the weeds on this topic, stress physiology, this is an excellent book to read. 
It's called why zebras don't get ulcers. And the reason zebras don't get ulcers and mammals in general don't get ulcers, stress related to zebras, is because the stress is acute. It's written by a guy at Stanford, Robert Sapolsky. On this slide, he's on your left. He's a brilliant scientist and he's, he's somewhat of a character. Um, for like the last 40 years or so, um, Dr. Sapolsky's been, you know, Stanford gets out, he goes to Africa for the, for the summer, and he studies baboon social hierarchy. And he looks, as a stress physiologist, he sees which in the, in the baboon troop, which are the most stressed out baboons? And the ones that are most stressed out, he follows from a health perspective. The ones that are most stressed out have more belly fat, just like humans get. They have more parasites because their immune system is suppressed. Um, they, 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 their, their tissue breaks down, they lose muscle mass, like all the same stress-related diseases that baboons get when they have social stress. Who do you think would be the most stressed out baboon? Do you think it would be the alpha male up there because he's got so much, so much responsibility? No. The second guy, number two. <laughs> yeah, it's, and, and people will sometimes, no, it's not the top guy, he's got a name, right? It's the bottom people, right? It's not the bottom baboons. It's the middle baboons. It's the ones who have to keep an eye on everything that's going on, and they're getting yelled at from above all the time, right? They can't catch a break. They're always under stress, either top down or bottom up. And so those are the middle managers. Those are the baboons that have 25 hours worth of stuff to do in a 24-hour day, right? They are, they are us, and they have the same kinds of problems. And so, you know, if they had this, if they were a zebra, and their only source of stress was the lion, they would have a fight or flight reaction. They would get away 60 seconds later, or if they didn't get away, their stress response is over anyway. So, so, <laughs> uh, but that, that's fine. We can do that all day long. Stress response, stress response. Humans don't have that kind of stress, right? These, 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 two, these two graphics are from a book I wrote 20 years ago to educate people about this, that. When our stress comes from work and deadlines and traffic jams and, 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 and uh, bills and all that kind of stuff, we have the exact same stress response. We don't have the fight or flight response. And then it, it continues and very dramatically, uh, rest in peace, stress is killing us because in a lot of ways it really is. This is one of the reasons that I really recommend that people exercise on a daily basis. That's our modern version of the fight or flight response. You're not going to get out of your car on 94 out here in a traffic jam and start doing jumping jumps, right? You're, you're, that would be wonderful for you from a physiological response perspective, but we're not going to do it. That's why exercise is so important to help us lose those stress hormones for what they're supposed to do. So if we don't do that, if we're exposed to stress on a regular basis, this is what happens. These are neurons. And I'm showing you these because they're, they're a very visual cell. Um, what I'm showing you is that a normal stress, normal cortisol situation, your cells look amazing. This is like a supermodel of neurons, right? It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's got long projection. They're there are very robust. The one over here, you don't need to be a neurologist to see that it looks sick. It's physically shrunken. It, it doesn't have as many projections. The ones that are there might be physically disrupted. So in a brain, this would not work very well. You'd have, you know, the mouse that this was taken out of would be forgetting his keys all the time, right? It'd be one of those bad memory, bad creativity, bad problem solving, bad, bad laying down memories, and bad picking and memories back up. You see that physical disruption. Um, we see it in humans, too. We can measure it with MRIs and different kinds of brain scans to show that memory parts of the brain break down faster in response to stress. But this catabolic effect, tissue breaking down faster than it can build back up, that happens in every tissue in the body. It happens in your brain, it happens in your skin, it happens in your muscles, it happens in your bones, it happens in your immune system, it happens in every single tissue except one tissue responds anabolically to chronic stress. Do you guys know what tissue that is? It grows in response to chronic stress. Anyone? Adipose tissue. And specifically, oh, visceral fat, belly fat. So much so that we, people who study this, we call it stress fat because it's so predominantly driven by 
a cortisol overexposure. So here's, here's those guys right here. This is abdominal fat accumulation. Two different people, low stress, low cortisol. And what's, what I've done here is colorize the fat in yellow so it's easier to pick out. So just to orient you, this is, a, this is like a slice at the level of somebody's belly button. Belly button would be up here. Here's the spine, here's the kidneys. No intra-abdominal fat in this person. The, both of these people have the same overall body fat, around 30%. But this person carries it all right there in the midsection, right, right there in that apple shape. And so this is bad for two reasons. Nobody wants to carry their fat there. It's just not the silhouette that we want. But the other reason this is bad is because this is a very particularly metabolic, toxically metabolic kind of fat that's going to lead to high cholesterol and blood sugar problems and heart disease, right? This is, this is, the, this is the kind of fat that leads to, to diabetes and, and syndrome and things like that. You know, so we definitely don't want to be in that situation. Um, both of them have the same total body fat, and the distribution is just different. And so that's one of the ways that cortisol preferentially gets you to store your fat here in your midsection, and that's what makes some of these stress-related diseases so much worse because of inflammation and because of, because of the things that follow from that. So cortisol isn't all bad. It's something that we need plenty of, but we should, we should only get it certain doses at certain times of day. This is what a typical cortisol rhythm should look like. Um, normal diurnal or, 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 or circadian rhythm of cortisol. It should peak right around the morning time when you're trying to get out of bed, right? It's a stress hormone. It's rising to get us ready to face the stresses of the day, to, to be able to respond to all those demands. But then it should slowly dissipate through the rest of the day, reaching its lowest point in the middle of the night. And so this is what, 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 you, would, what you would feel from this, is you would feel energetic and motivated and stress resilient and ready to take on the day. And then at the end of the day, you know, right around here, right around here, here we are, our cortisol level should be dissipating. We should our lowest point in the middle of the night, we should start to feel nice and relaxed. As soon as our head hits the pillow, we should just fall asleep and go into deep sleep and have a beautiful eight hours of very restful body recovery sleep and REM recovery sleep for our brains. I can see people are just laughing right now like, because that sounds ridiculous. That's not our normal life. What typically happens? We're fatigued during the day because we don't get a cortisol peak. We feel, um, we feel tense and restless at night. We can't recover because this is what our day looks like. This is what our kids' day looks like. This is what our days look like, where we, you know, we, we, our cortisol is up, but then we have an emergency. And then it starts to dissipate, and then we have another emergency. And it starts to dissipate, and you can see how that goes. The difference between the blue line, where you're supposed to be, and the red line where most of us are, this is your cortisol overexposure. And so this is still also sort of going to be in like the normal range, but when we measure cortisol in our research studies, we'll take multiple measurements from people so that we can get an idea of what their rhythm looks like so we can see what their 24-hour exposure looks like. That, this gap right here, is what leads to your brain breaking down and your belly building up and all those other catabolic effects. So it's, a, so it's a terrible situation to be in. So um, what you also see is that that cortisol will start to block the effects of a lot of the biochemistry that we, that we actually want. It'll block neurotransmitters. So your serotonin and your norepinephrine and your dopamine can't get to where they need to get because they can't get by that, that blockade of cortisol. Your metabolic hormones won't be able to work well. So your thyroid gets blocked. So your metabolism drops. Your insulin gets blocked. So your blood sugar fluctuates all the time. You're, when your cortisol is high, it's telling your brain that you're hungry specifically for what? Sugar, junk. The, like what, what, when you're under the most stress and you drive by the golden arches, they look really good when you're under stress. They look so, so good when you're, when you're calm, right? That's your cortisol speaking. So there's a lot going on here in terms of what the, bio, what, what the, what the biochemistry is doing. But what we sense is those is those uh, those those symptoms right? All of these are related. Um, so so I, I've done a whole you know hour or ninety minutes on just this idea of uh, PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, 
all being really the same underlying problem and the, and the, and the real sort of deep biochemistry around that. You can find that recorded on my, on my blog site if you want. But look, these are all just different labels of the same underlying problem, depression, heart disease, cardiomyalgia, anxiety, which makes sense that those would be related in certain ways. But then we start looking at irritable bowel syndromes and inflammatory bowel problems and, and, and metabolic problems like inability to lose weight. Those are all related at their core to the, to the microbiome. So a lot of the kind of work that I do is, is looking at people who have these kinds of problems and trying to drill it back to, its, to the roofiest aspect of biochemistry that we can. You know, so you can look at something, let's take depression just, just for example, but we can go with any of these. That person probably has a neurotransmitter problem, and it might be low serotonin, it might be serotonin that can't get to where it needs to get in terms of the receptor like I just talked about a minute ago. It could, it, could be, it could be other neurotransmitters, but you have to ask yourself the question, well, if it's not that, what's underlying the level of the neurotransmitters? Could it be inflammation that's causing some of those blockages, right? In medicine, there's this revelation that's happening now across medicine that wait a minute, the majority of depression might actually be because these people are over inflamed. And if we control the inflammation, the neurotransmitter piece normalizes on its own. But then you can ask yourself the question of what's underlying that inflammation and it may be immune system dysfunction because that's what drives your overall level of inflammation anyway. Well, what's underlying the immune system disruption? It could be something that we call loosely gut. Your gut should be a permeable, uh, should be an impermeable membrane, right? It should have really good integrity, just like your blood-brain barrier. It should be the same exact amount of thing, but sometimes it can become leaky. It can become, it can become permeable. That can lead to these immune system problems. What's driving that leaky gut? Or what's driving that, that, that lack of, of gut integrity? It could be too many bad bacteria. It could be not enough good bacteria. It could be a low mucus lining in the gut. It could be... It could be an inflamed gut, like having a sunburn on the inside of your gut is basically what we're looking at there. So it could be all of those different things, and we need to try to tease it out. As far back as we can go right now scientifically is the microbiome level. So a lot of the kind of work that I do is kind of like that dominoes game of figuring out which one leads to which one, which, to which one, which one. And right now the science is telling us that microbiome is as, is as far back as we can go. And so, you know, I told you this a, a little bit already, that this, I, this whole new field of psychoneuroimmunology is really trying to link all of these things together as one big coordinated system. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm either old enough or young enough, I don't know how to tell this story, of, of, of having been in graduate school at the time when they used to teach us that these were different things. The, the, the body was the body and there was physical health and the mind was the mind and there was mental health and they were completely separate things. And now we're trying to break down all that old thinking and really show people that how they're really linked to each other. And you know, traditional, medica traditional medical systems, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, have always had this construct, but because we couldn't measure it, because we couldn't quantify it with scientific techniques, a lot of people just say, oh, phew, that's hocus pocus. Oh, that's, that's, that, that, that's mysticism. But now we can actually go and we can say, aha, it's because of this neurotransmitter or this stress hormone or this cytokine or this bacterial strain. And it's really this whole new idea of thinking about these problems as not just brain issues, but as gut brain issues. And even bigger than that, gut brain axis issues. That is completely changing all of science and medicine. It's completely changing how we even think about what, what it means to be a healthy human. So this idea that we started off with, of the second brain and the microbiome, um, does anyone know how many, how many cells, how many bacterial cells are in the average microbiome? Anyone know what that number is? It's a big number. Let me, let me give you a frame of reference. In our human bodies, we have about 10 trillion human cells. So do you think the microbiome number is bigger or smaller than 10 trillion? Bigger. 10 times bigger, it's a about 100 trillion, right? So think about that, 10 trillion human cells and 100 trillion bacterial cells. That means that what is sitting in your seat right now is 90% bacteria. You're only 10% human. 
<laughs> right? I mean, that when you stop to think about that, you're like, some people are like, wow, and other people are like, ew. Oh, all that bacteria. And we also like you know, when when we study this, there's a there's a there's a microbiome, there's a bacterial colony in your gut, there's a colony in your lungs, there's a colony in your mouth, there's a colony on your skin. How many people know the know the peanuts cartoon? You guys know that Charlie Brown and that the character Pig Pen has this cloud around him all the time. We have the exact same invisible cloud of bacteria around us right now. So the seats in here are close enough where if there's somebody, so ma'am, on both sides of you, you're all sharing the bacteria cloud. So left and right are not close enough to share, but we're sharing both of them right now, right? And that's and that's actually a good thing. It's it's one of the the, the, there are there are scientists that are called microbiome ecologists who study like the diversity of the microbiome. Um, some of them have a theory that one of the reasons that humans are social creatures is because we've been driven by the bacteria to have the behavior of being social, of gathering like this, so that the bacteria can exchange genetic material with the other bacteria. Right. So in, in, you know, in a certain sense, when we go to these microbiome conferences, we joke around about like. Do any of us actually have free will? Is it really the bacteria that is just telling us what to do all the time? And there's and there's a, there's a little bit of truth to that. Um, and and you know I I I I I mentioned earlier just briefly the fact that the bacterial gene can determine in large part which of our human genes are turned on and turned off. When we look at the microbiome it, for, using a genetic lens, then we're talking about the genes in our body being 99.9% .9 bacterial genes, and those are modulating what's happening in our human genome. So the genes that we're born with don't mean a heck of a lot, to tell you the truth, in terms of our, our propensity to develop a certain disease. Our propensity to develop that disease is, we're, you know, we're, it's like a poker game. You're dealt a certain number of cards, but you can throw a few back and choose different ones. That's your environmental exposure. The throwing cards and choosing other ones is what diet do you choose? What exercise pattern do you choose? What, what, who, who are you sitting in between when you come to one of these things, right? Those are all things that can determine the expression of your genes, and that can determine the, the, the diseases that we face. So you get the idea that it's really changing a lot of how we think. The microbiome, um, you know, this sounds a lot like science fiction to people when they hear it the first time. And I guarantee, for the people who hadn't heard of microbiome before, now you're going to go out into the rest of your lives, and you're going to see microbiome stories all over the place. Um, if, if mental wellness is one of the one of the key sort of national conversations that we're having, microbiome is the other conversation. And what, what you know what 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 I'm trying to do with these kinds of things is bring those two conversations together and say, you know what, they're the same conversation. We just need to link them up and know, let people know that. If you get your microbiome right, you're going to get your mood right. If you get your microbiome right, you're going to get your physical health right because of all these different ways. Um, people understand this at sort of a gut level because of the, the, the words we have in our vocabulary. Gut feelings, sick to my stomach, I was gutted by something. Like those kinds of things are words and sayings because we've always sort of sensed them. We didn't have the science to measure them and to quantify them until just recently. So those signals will end up going out of your gut to your brain, but they come back. They come from your brain to your gut, and they go through what we call the axis in between. You know, so, so it's important that we do things in the gut. It's important that we do things in the brain still. It's not like we're forgetting the brain now. There's plenty of good things we can do there, but we also have to do things to make sure that this axis, this, this redundant system of communication between those two brains, we want to make sure that that's as efficient as possible. And there's things we can do in the nervous system, in the neurotransmitter um, cascade. We can change hormones, we can change cytokines, which are, which are inflammatory com um, 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 compounds. The immune system is like, when's the only time we think about our immune system? When we're sick, yeah, as soon as we get sick, we go, oh, better bump up my immune system or bolster my immune system, we should think of our immune system all the time because in addition to it shielding us from you know, the environment out there, it also is a very uh, important surveillance organ. It can actually reach down into your microbiome, into your intestine, 
survey what's happening with your microbiome, and then take that information up to the brain, or take it to your adrenal cells, which are your stress response system, or take it to your thyroid tissue and help determine metabolism. And then while it's there, we'll get information from that outpost and bring it back to the microbiome. So, you know, that as a communication network is this overlapping system that tells us that, that in and of itself, that these signals are going back and forth between all these different pathways, tell us, tells us that it's really important for human health for the two brains to be always constantly communicating with each other. And there's ways that we can optimize that. So I want to share a, a couple of like mechanistic experiments, right? This is all nice theory, but how can we actually see if it works? Well, we can, we can, use, we can use mice as a, as a way to transmit microbiomes back and forth. We can see how a microbiome influences a particular, a particular disease or condition. So here's an example where you can take genetically identical mice and all you're doing is flip-flopping their microbiomes. Any, anyone know how we do that? Poop. Poop. <laughs> yeah, no one likes to talk about poop, but people will sometimes say to me that, I'll talk to a lot of them, God, your work is really fascinating. How do you do all that kind of stuff? I'm like, well, to do a cortisol, I have to get some spit from you. To look at your cytokines, I have to get some blood. Um, to look at uh, uh, some of the inflammatory markers, uh, we'll, we'll take some urine. Uh, and to get your microbiome, I need a poop sample, right? So after I get to the poop sample, people are like, never mind. It's not as interesting <laughs> as I thought it was. Um, but, but, we, but we do that in our trials. And we get a lot of really good information. So in mice, sometimes you'll, you'll collect you know, fecal pellets. And you can, mice are, are, are the kinds of animals that eat each other's poop to try to transmit the different microbiomes back and forth from each other. If you do it in a very scientific controlled way, you can take an obese microbiome put it into a lean mouse, and the lean mouse becomes obese. It goes back the other way, too. You can take a lean mouse microbiome, put it into an obese mouse, and the obese mouse will lose weight. So people immediately say, could I sign up for that study <laughs> right, to get the lean microbiome? But what you end up seeing is that you don't just transmit the, 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 the phenotype, the, you know, the, the lean or obese. You transmit the entire behavior of that donor mouse. So that donor mouse doesn't just gain weight. They're hungry all the time. They don't go on the wheel. They sit around. They hoard food. They're always seeking out. They have higher appetite. Their whole behavior has changed. We can do it with, with, with introverted mice and extroverted mice. So an introverted mouse would be one that you would put in the cage and it would immediately go and try to hide. It wouldn't want to come out. It wouldn't want to meet its litter mates. It wouldn't get on the wheel. It would just kind of you know, chill out and play video games or something like that, right? It, it, just, it just wouldn't want to be out there. Um, a, an extroverted mouse, you put it in and it explores every corner and it runs over and it looks at this guy and it gets on the wheel and it's, it's just out there a life of the party kind of a mouse, right? Completely different behaviors. And you can take, you can take the introverted microbiome, put it into the extrovert and it becomes an introvert and vice versa, extroverts and introvert. You know, you, you, guys, you guys get the scenario now. So like that tells us that these behaviors are, are transmittable um, uh, 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 between, between organisms. Um, people don't care about mice. So what happens with humans, right? We can take um, depressed humans. So this is from a trial. that has been repeated many, many times now. So it's a real thing. Um, here are the microbiomes from two groups of human subjects. Uh, what you're seeing is in the red dots major depressive disorder in the blue dots, control situation, non-depressed people. And immediately, what you're looking at here is microbiome patterns, right? This data sort of represents it graphically. And what you see here, you don't have to be a microbiome specialist to know, there is a difference in the patterns of what a depressed person has versus what a controlled person has. And so you can take that, that human microbiome of a depressed person put it into a non-depressed mouse, and the mouse becomes depressed. So there's something in that microbiome that is leading to that behavioral change. Um, and th like th these kind of data have gotten people to start thinking about, huh, I wonder if I could get a microbiome transplant. Do you think that's possible in humans? Yeah, we're doing it today, right? But we're doing it for things like um, 
like um, like like C. diff, Clostridium difficile infections, right, which give people diarrhea that they can die from, right? It's an opportunistic infection. You'll get post surgery in the hospital. It's very resistant to sort of traditional treatment with antibiotics, and so people can die from that. So why not transmit? Why not transfer um, a healthy microbiome into those people? Ninety-five percent cure rate, just like that. Right, so absolutely, it's the it's the standard of treatment now after doing it for two or three years. Right, it's 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 miraculous stuff. So now the question becomes: Could we get the same for other gut derived kinds of problems like depression or anxiety or autism or any or or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or any of these things that we know originate in the gut and we're not quite there yet. So the best we can do is say: Can we give specific bacteria? like a probiotic supplement? Could we give a Mediterranean diet? Could we help, could we give an exercise regimen? There's all kinds of natural ways that we can modulate that microbiome to get the same kinds of beneficial effects here. So it, it reached such a fever pitch during the last Olympics, we thought there was gonna be a problem with, with poop doping, right? That, that an elite level athlete would, would sell or donate to other teammates their poop sample, right? Their microbiome sample that could be inoculated into another athlete to give them the benefits of what that athlete was, was doing. And so there's a, there's a precedence for this, at least in mechanistic studies. We know that marathoners have a microbiome that helps them reduce lactic acid during their race. We know that, my, that, that endurance athletes are able to metabolize carbohydrates at a level because they're at a higher level because of their microbiome. We know that some of the some of the high level power athletes, like sprinters, have a different microbiome that enables them to put on more muscle mass faster than somebody with a different microbiome. So, so I'm a cyclist, right? You can see I'm wearing a cycling jersey right now. Um, I, I, I've done this kind of stuff for years, and somebody asked me one time. They said, "If you could get a sample of Lance Armstrong's poop, what would you do with it?" And immediately, I said, "I would." Put it in my blender. I would make it slowly, and I would get a turkey baster, and I would do a microbiome transplant on myself. Right? And I was, you know, I was joking around with him, right? And then I thought about it for a second, and he had this look of horror on his face. Right? You can go on YouTube and you can see do-it-yourself microbiome transplants. Right? Brace yourself if you're going to watch those videos. Um, but I thought about it for a second, and I went, wait a minute. I wouldn't just potentially transmit his endurance benefits, I might transmit his entire behavioral characteristics to my body, to my psychology. And he's, you know, if you know anything about Lance Armstrong, the of the story, he's pretty aggressive, you know, kind of a not nice guy. Um, so anyway, I wouldn't want to transmit that, but we can't choose. There was a real, I'll, I'll tell one more story and I'll get back to my slides. Um, there was a really famous case of a, of a marathon runner, female marathon runner, not professional or anything, but just, you know, recreationally active, but did lots of marathons. So lean, fast, you know, this is what she did as her hobby. She, got, she had a surgery. She got C. diff. She was, it was resistant to any of the standard treatments. So she got a microbiome transplant from a close enough relative. Um, and over the course of three months, she gained about 30 pounds. Just like that. Right? She, she didn't want to run. She, she wanted to eat everything in sight. She was putting on weight like crazy. What do, you, what do you think the characteristic of that donor was? She was overweight. But at that time, we weren't thinking in those terms. We were thinking she didn't have Clostridium difficile. She did. Let's put the good microbiome in, fix that problem. The other aspects of it were just not at the surface of science. We didn't really consider them. So there are companies now that are microbiome. Um, uh, uh, donor companies, right? So you can go in and, and donate blood and it goes to the blood bank. You can go in and you can donate poop and it goes into the, into the microbiome bank. It's harder to become a donor for your microbiome than it is to get into MIT, right? Because of all of the parameters that you have to pass, the parasites and the right, the, the right bacteria and et cetera, et cetera. So, so anyway, that was a, that was a big aside. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to kind of get into like the nitty gritty of how can people use this kind of stuff to benefit you? Get out of the theoretical and get a little bit into like 
how do we actually put this into practice? So some of the some of the areas that I think people are be most interested in are these. Um, and, and, and again, just like I've done a deep dive on some of the areas of metabolism, um, I've done a deep dive on these too. So um, I, I, I did a whole session where I talked specifically just about AD, autism, pandas, which are very unique types of uh, gut brain access dysfunctions, but they, but they, and they're different conditions, but they share a lot of the same underlying biochemistry. That emanates in the that emanates in the gut, uh, and so you know, I said a little bit of, of this already. That you know, it's it's never just one thing that's off. It's usually a constellation of things that, that that's off. And so we really need to get in with a with a with that um, with that multifactorial mindset of modulating many different things simultaneously because of how they interact with each other. So dopamine plus serotonin is what's driving your appetite. One of the things that's driving your appetite. You can broaden that, you can look at all these different emotions or mood states or, or things that we can measure psychologically and drill them back to what primary or overlapping neurotransmitter there is. So unfortunately, just like with the antidepressants and anti-anxieties and sleep drugs and things like that that I animated on that previous slide, when we're in the situation of an ADD diagnosis or an autism diagnosis, these are the kinds of things that we, have, that, that we have access to. And unfortunately, these, just like the, the other things, are not a multifactorial solution for a multifactorial problem. Um, my only son, who's 17 now, and is an honor roll student and is in his student government and does very well at school, when he was in fifth grade, his teachers came to us and in no uncertain terms, indicated to us that this kid needed to be medicated, right? And so my question kind of is, well, was he just a fifth grade boy? Um, or did he really have ADHD? And so we went through the whole thing of my wife was very reserved, bit her tongue and said, okay, I think my husband's gonna have something to say about this and we're gonna try to figure this out. And so instead of doing this approach, which is always gonna be there for you as a secondary option, if the natural therapies don't work well enough, we, we ended up putting them on a combination of, uh, of a pine bark extract um, and, a, and a green tea extract, an amino acid called theanine, um, that have really good research on them to lower stress and improve focus. And so we did that for him for a week. It was literally one of these deals where, you know, he, he's not going to swallow the pills of the fifth grader. And you can't really empty them into his orange juice because they're so bitter. So I'm doing one of these deals where you're like, Kind of hide it in his smoothie and he's going are you putting something in there <laughs> no 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 here drink this and he's, you put something in there didn't you so it was that kind of stuff but within a week his teacher came back up to my wife and said thank you for taking our advice <laughs> thinking that we did this because he was so much better and as parents like we had the total parent placebo response right that we were giving him something we knew we were giving him something and we were doing this i think he's better and so to have that sort of, you know, unknown third party say, he's better, you know, it was, it was like, ah, yes. And so, you know, those are things that, that are out there for, you know, in, 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 um, in Japan, they use L-theanine as a first line ADD treatment before you go to these things. In New Zealand, they use pine bark as a first line AD treatment before they go to these things, right? So again, fly swatters before sledgehammers. That's the, that's the sort of motif that we try to get people in. And so the, you know, the question on those sorts of things is where is it having its effect? Where is the theanine working? Where's the pine bark working? Where's the, there's all kinds, there's glutamine, there's different strains of probiotics. Where are they having their effect? It might be here, it might be here, it might be at the level of the gut lining. It might be with the, with the actual gut microbiome, but the, but the, the and, and that can get complicated. And that's maybe where this falls apart sometimes for people is that you're like, I don't know, I don't know which one to start with. Do I start with a neurotransmitter modulator? Do I start with a microbiome modulator? Do I start with a immune system modulator? Again, multifactorial. The more things that you can add at once, like a Mediterranean diet, is going to address all of these. And so you also have to ask, is there something that's throwing a monkey wrench into the, into the mix. So you could be doing all the good things in terms of getting this all to talk well, but if you keep throwing in 
some problematic food here that is leading to more inflammation or leading to an inflamed gut or you know that can that can just be putting the brakes on all the good stuff that you're trying to do. Um, so these are these are some things we might talk about at the end. I'm gonna skip over that one. Um, so a big part of what's going on here is is what we broadly refer to as leaky gut. Um, if your gut lining is not uh, exhibiting this tight junctions and having very good integrity, things that are in the gut can leak across, things that are in the gut can leak across into the systemic bloodstream. When that happens, when they leak through and they don't get sort of checked at the border, so to speak, they can set off an immune system reaction, which can set off an inflammatory reaction, which can lead to something, I'm gonna see if it's on here, that's called endotoxemia. It's not on this particular graphic. But that can put a break on your ability to lose weight. It can put a break on your ability to feel good in terms of your neurotransmitters getting where they need to be. And so for a lot of people, this is the thing that needs to be fixed. And one of the things that can cause the leaky gut is an undiagnosed leaky problem or an undiagnosed casein problem or an undiagnosed problem with dyes in your foods, right? There are all kinds of things that can upset the apple cart of what we're doing. So you have to get in a mentality of, remove the offending thing and then start to rebalance it. Because if you try to do rebalancing in the face of that continual destruction, that continual, you know, poke in the eye, you're, 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 you're never going to get the kinds of benefits that are, that are possible. So I'm just, I'm, I'm going I'm to skip through a couple of these different things. Um, let me stop on this one. So let's use autism as a, as a good example. Um, classic textbook dysfunction of the, of the gut-brain axis. Uh, people with autism, whether kids or adults, have microbiome disruptions, they have leaky gut issues, they have food intolerances, uh, they have a lot of stomach aches, they have immune system and systemic inflammation uh, issues, and they have behavioral problems and a wide range. They can be severe, they can be mild, they can come and go based on stress levels, based on sleep patterns, based on dietary inputs. And so from mouse studies, because you can get in and manipulate every part of that gut brain axis, we know, and this has been shown over and over and over again, if you, if you change the microbiome using probiotics in this example, you change the, the composition of the gut microbiome, so you change the structure of what's happening there, that, in, that improves the, the gut integrity, so you reduce leaky gut, it reduces the leakage of those metabolites, it restores metabolism in the bloodstream, and it changes autism-related behavior. So mice, you know, we can't say they have autism, but they have autism-related behaviors. You know, they, they have repetitive behaviors. They have antisocial behaviors. They have, um, you know, all the whole, the whole uh, constellation of things. And so what if we did this in humans? What if we could take that same scenario and try to impose that into human subjects? So this study came out this summer, came out in June, this past June. This one came out last week. What they're both looking at is taking different prebiotic fibers. So fibers that have a specific effect on growing good bacteria. And what they showed in both studies was, and they're using different prebiotic fibers. This one used a, a fiber called a, called a GOS, G-O-S, the lacto-oligosaccharide. This one used a galactomannan. So different structures of fiber that are feeding different populations of bacteria, and those bacteria are now producing different signaling compounds, like serotonin and dopamine, and short-chain fatty acids, and things like that. So who cares? Well, we care because the, the, the people in these trials were given fiber. As a result of that fiber supplementation, their microbiomes changed. As a result of that, they got different signals coming into the, into the gut-brain axis. As a result of that, they had fewer, um, they, had, they had less um, uh, uh, gut, uh, less leaky gut, so better gut integrity. Um, they had fewer uh, food intolerances, fewer gastrointestinal distress, so fewer stomach aches and bloating and things like that. Um, they had uh, lower inflammation systemic effects, like I said already, and they had better behavior in both of these studies. And I, and I point these out because 10 years ago, if either of these research groups, this one in, I think these guys might have been in Belgium, these guys were in Japan, um, if they had gone to their universities and said, we've got a brilliant idea, we're going to get a group of autistic people, we're going to give them fiber, 
and we're going to see how it changes their behavior. Ten years ago, they would have somebody just laughed right out loud right here. That's what they would have done. They would have laughed at them and they would have said, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of before. But because of what we've learned over the last three to five years about the microbiome and about the gut brain axis, now we can go and say, this is exactly what we need to do in the first place. Um, so anyway, these, these papers are both open access. So you can, you can uh, you know, like I said, these slides are up on my website. So you can look at the title of the paper and you can go to the website, you can download it, you can read the whole paper for yourself if you want to. Um, and, you know, so the company that I work for, Amari, we're a mental wellness company. We want people to get this information and share this information. So everything that I just said, we make cartoons, we make infographics of it that are downloadable from our website. You can download them, you can email them to people, you can post them on your own social media to really get this idea across to people. Because it's great that you guys are here, but think about all the people who are out there who need to hear this kind of story. This is a, sort of an easy way that you can, you can let them know that a healthy gut and a healthy mind and the trillion, 100 trillion bacteria and how to grow the right garden and what strains of bacteria are actually associated with this effect. One of the, one of the sort of soapboxes that I get up on, um, and, I'll, and I'll do it if I have time. Let me, okay, I'll save it for a second. But let me just say that the benefits of probiotics are completely dependent on the strain. So this, for example, it's Lactobacillus helveticus R0052. This specifically helps with depression. There are other Helveticus species that help with things like inflammation or immune system function, which are wonderful benefits. But uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's another example. This Lactobacillus rhamnosus R0011 specifically helps with relaxation and anti-stress effects because it improves your, your GABA signal. And that's the neurotransmitter that helps us relax when we're tense. There's another lactobacillus rhamnosus that I recommend to people all the time. The strain is GG. And I bet you can find it at any grocery store here. GG is really good for helping with traveler's diarrhea, right? So if you go to, you know, on vacation and you come back and you have a problem, you should go get lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. It's gonna, it's gonna cure that problem but it's not gonna do anything for this. Imagine if you heard me talk and you said, oh yeah, lactobacillus rhamnosus something or other, uh, I need that to help me with my stress, and you go off and you get the one that helps with your diarrhea, and that's not the problem you're trying to treat, right? That's, that's, that's this idea of stress and treatment. Um, that the signals go back and forth both ways. That, that you know, how do those signals go back and forth? What, you know, what is actually carrying that information? What are some of the things that you can do naturally to improve your microbiome. So on the, on the TV segment that I did this morning that's gonna to run tomorrow, I had all of these on the table in front of me. We had probiotic sources in terms of fermented foods. We had prebiotic fiber sources in terms of um, beans and oatmeal and green leafy vegetables and things like that. And then we had what we call phytobiotic, things like apples and grapes and, 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 and um, uh, um, uh, flavonoids from dark chocolate and tea that can help to protect the bacteria once you grow it. If you can eat a diet like this, this is going to naturally bolster that, very, that vibrant, diverse, resilient garden, the rainforest that we really want to have in here. So probably the one big problem with a, with a standard American diet, you guys know what those initials spell, right? Standard American diet, sad, Right? It's a sad diet that leads us to be sad because it's leading to a very, um, what's, what's the opposite of diverse? Like what's non-diverse? What's the word that I'm looking for? Homogeneous. Um, maybe, anyway, you guys get the idea. Um, it's, it, 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 it doesn't have a lot of different species. That is associated with more depression. That's associated with, 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 with more health problems. And so if we can get a more diverse microbiome, that's gonna that's gonna help, and this is this is where we do it from a dietary perspective. Sleeping the right amount can change your microbiome. Exercising the right amount can change your microbiome. We could analyze three different microbiome patterns, and with reasonable accuracy, I could tell you which one was the elite athlete, which is the weekend warrior, and which is the couch potato, just based on their microbiome patterns, because exercise has a big effect on on changing what grows there. We know that mindfulness, yoga, and meditation, and mindfulness, and breath work, 
can all do that as well because the signals that go from the brain down to the gut can change what grows there. Then the signals that go back from the gut to the brain can not only change how the brain functions, but over time can change the structure of the brain. So we can measure neurological wiring changes in the brain based on what we're doing in the gut. So there really is that crosstalk that goes back and forth between each one. Uh, so here's what I talked about before about you know, this idea of the probiotic strain matters. And the reason I harp on this a little bit is that probiotic supplements are really hot in the, in the, in the health world right now. But I would say probably 90% of the companies don't even tell you what strain is in that product. They'll tell you um, genus, species, but they will leave off the strain. And it's the strain that determines what the actual benefit is, right? So, you know, look for that. If a, if a company is using scientifically documented strains, they're going to put that on the label, and they're going to tell you why they're doing it, because they're, because they're not cheap, right? They're not the generic probiotics that are out there. So, so, so look for that. Here's a trial that my group just did. It, it, so it's not published yet. Uh, it's been peer-reviewed, and it's been accepted for publication, but it's probably not going to appear in print for a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. That's just the sort of cadence of what these academic papers take. Um, but we've presented these data at lots and lots of different scientific conferences. And look, here's the, here's the, here's the, here's the, you know, the eye-catching, um, awesome title. The effect of coordinated probiotic, prebiotic, phytobiotic supplementation on microbiome balance and psychological mood state in healthy stress subjects. <sighs> right? Boring. <laughs> um, but, but what happened in this trial was we specifically recruited people who didn't have depression who weren't taking antidepressant drugs, who didn't have irritable bowel syndrome, right? So they didn't have any of the mental illness problems, they didn't have any of the gut health problems. They were in sort of that medium zone of just being, having a lot of stress, maybe being fatigued, maybe being restless, but not being sort of diagnosed on either end. Does that make sense to you guys? Do you guys know anybody who would fall into that category? Maybe? Yeah, like everybody. It was the, one of the easiest trials that we've ever had to recruit for because we just ask people, you know, are you chronically stressed? And then we give, them a, we give them a screening form to make sure they're stressed enough, but there's lots and lots of people to choose from. And so these people guaranteed at the beginning of the trial would have said, well, I don't have those problems. I don't have the mental problems and I don't have the gut problems, right? I'm, I'm fine, right? I'm, I'm doing okay. I thought I'd be doing better, I guess. But I'm doing fine. I don't, I'm not there and I'm not there. And so the question is, can we actually measure a change in those people if they don't have a problem in the first place? And so on the left-hand side, you're looking at the microbiome changes. On the right-hand side, you're looking at the psychological changes. And so what you're seeing here is that significant changes in the microbiome. This is just a snapshot of what we get. If there's a, if there's a problem with microbiome research is that it gives us too much data. It's, it's literally like when we give somebody their data back, it's like we drop the phone book in front of them, right? It's, you know, they'll sort of page through it and go, that, thanks, you know, and they kind of push it aside because it's, it's almost indecipherable, it's so much data. Um, and so what we do is we try to simplify it. We use something called a, uh, called a composite score, which kind of averages everything that's going on in your microbiome. It's looking at the good guys, like lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, which go up significantly. It's looking at the bad guys and see how much they go down. It's looking at um, specific classes of, of the microbiome, like acromancia, which is a signal for us about your leaky gut and about your mucus lining in your gut to, to, to you know, tell us if you have good integrity or not. We look at ratios between metabolic families of bacteria. This Fermi keeps the bacteroides ratio. Is, is related to your metabolism. So if it changes in a positive direction, we can say all your blood sugar control is probably going to be better, all your ability to lose weight is probably going to be more pronounced. So we put all of that into our algorithm and we get in this file 30 day supplementation, 17% higher overall composite score when we're using those targeted strains and the right kinds of prebiotics, like the ones that we use in the autism study. But that's great, right? Microbiome changes, we can show people the numbers, but you know, I, I, I joke with people sometimes to say not a single person in the trial woke up on, on the last day of the, of the study and went, oh, my bifidobacterium feels really good today, right? Oh, it feels 30% better, right? We can't feel that, but what we feel is that that bifido is better, 
So now it's producing different signaling molecules, like more short-chain fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory, like more serotonin, which is going to lift our mood, like dopamine, which is going to increase our motivation. And then we can measure this, which is the psychology of that. So the way that we do this is with something called profile of mood states. Uh, and we actually have ways that people can test themselves in, in, sort of a, in sort of a simplified version of what we use in our research trial. But this enables us to show not just that, that people are feeling better, but how they're feeling better, you know? Because somebody could feel better because their energy is higher. And they would say, yeah, I feel better. But we can, we can drill down with these what are called sub, subscales and see that all the negative mood states are going down significantly. Tension, depression, anger, fatigue, confusion are all down. And then vigor, which in psychology research is the opposite of burnout, that positive mood state is going up significantly. So you can see that these people feel better, but they feel better in a very holistic, very robust way. And that's really, really cool to see. So here's, here's, the, here's the slides that, that, that are in the paper. Um, so placebo group, where you're looking at is three different time points um, over the course of, the, of that supplementation. In the, in the, in the supplementation group, lactic salts goes up, bifido goes up, overall composite score goes up. There's an overall measurement in here called global mood state. That's an overall well-being index. That improves 25 or 22, depending on which group you compare it against, whether you compare it to their baseline or you compare it to the control group. So people are feeling better. And here's all the subscales that I showed you before. But the thing that's cool about that is that, you know, you can take somebody who's not depressed and you can still reduce their feelings of depression by 55%. You can reduce their fatigue by 64%. And somebody who at the beginning was just, I guess I'm fine, like that sort of terminology. And th the reason that's important is because like that, those are life-changing kinds of things. That's going to make their tomorrow better than today, right? It doesn't happen one day. It happens third days, but still you get the point. They're going to do so much better. When we see something like this, bigger, improved by 44%, this, this is kind of my specialty area of research, looking at burned out people and trying to get them back to a state of normal vigor. That, 44%, is life changing. 20% um, would be life changing. Because if you take somebody who's burned out, they have, so, so vigor, the definition of vigor is a combination of physical energy, mental acuity, and emotional well being, all wrapped up into one measurement, right? And then we can measure the different subscales. But it's, a, it's this holistic feeling of not just energy, but almost like motivation. So when your burnout goes away and it's replaced by vigor, your brain fog goes away, your motivation to exercise gets better, your, your appetite levels change, so that at a subconscious level, you're eating better, you, you wouldn't even be realizing that. Um, you're, you're more inclined to be socially active. It, like So many things ripple out from that one change. That we, so I've been doing these kinds of studies for a long time. At the end of all of our trials, we're running one right now in Salt Lake City. Um, it'll end the end of this month. At the end of it, we're going to have a sort of an exit class like this. And we're going to say, here's what we found. Here's what your individual results are. We'll share those privately. But then we're going to have people say, in your own words, what happened? In your own words, what happened? And we'll get people who will say, oh, yeah, my brain fog is down. And then someone else will get up and they'll say, oh, for me, it was my energy levels came back. And then someone else will get up and say, oh, for me, it was that my, you know, that cloud over my head lifted and now my mood is better. Right? All these different ways will sort, of, will sort of dominate for individual people. And this was years ago. And it's always stuck with me. We had a woman who got up in the middle. And she went, yeah, I get a little bit, my brain fog is gone, my energy is better. And, you know, my, my mood is better. And you can see that she didn't have the words for it to describe how she was feeling. And she wasn't going to say, oh, my vigor is better, right? That's not, that's not how we talk, right? That sounds like very happy things, 1950s kind of women vigor stuff, right? So she wasn't going to say that. And you can see she didn't have the terminology. She just kind of gave up. And she goes, I don't know. I just know I'm getting a lot more vacuum and gut. <laughs> and, 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 and she felt really embarrassed and she kind of slumped out in her seat. And I pointed her out and I said, that's exactly what we're talking about, that you felt so much better than you did before that you felt like doing something with it, right? And so whether you want to call that motivation or whatever you want to, terminology you want to put on it, she was doing something with it. 
and that's the coolest thing about this kind of work is that that individual person is going to be better but then it ripples out from them and you know their 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 family is better and their co-workers are better and their school is better and etc cetera, etc cetera. this is very pro-social effect of you being in a, in a in a better psychological state um so the way we do this we let people take the tests themselves right so profile mood states is 65 questions and it takes 15 to 20 minutes for most people to fill it out and it's really hard to score so we do a we do a um a, a simplified version of it that you can just you can just do you know very quickly you know online remotely and it will spit out um, a score that will tell you sort of where you are on that mental wellness continuum and that you know at a certain level you know if you feel crappy or not right you don't need someone to say well you're a two or you're a four right that but once you know that and you can track it over time that's important because one thing that we see with, with, with human psychology studies is that sometimes we're not very good at noticing a change in ourselves for whatever reason humans are pretty good at knowing when you're going down when you're getting worse we can sense that but when we gradually get a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better and at the end of a month you're 44 percent better you could go to that person and if you haven't quantified it they will go i don't know i feel okay but i think i felt okay back there um i i don't i don't know if this worked for me or not and a lot of times that person who's saying i don't know if it works their wife is standing right behind them going oh it's working <laughs> you know because sometimes it's that person outside of us that notices that kind of effect and so this is one of the reasons we let people quantify it and then they can do whatever intervention that they want and then they can you know track it over time and see how they're see how they're tracking um so so um this obviously can get very complicated right? and when we start talking about different microbiomes and different neurotransmitters and things like that but it really really is as simple as this and we need to educate people about the fact that how you feel is not just in your head it's also in your gut the second brain and the microbiome plays a major role in your mental wellness and you can do something about it there's a lot of things that we can do about it um whether it's whether it's supplementation like i showed you there whether it's exercise, whether it's nutrition, whether it's stress management, whether it's getting better sleep, whether it's doing some meditation and some mindfulness, all of those things are very well documented at this point to have their effects across the gut brain axis to take us from wherever we are to a little bit to the right and a little bit to the right and a little bit to the right. And I was and I was I was talking to a gentleman before who's in a pretty good situation, right? He's probably, I'm just gonna guess your when you say you're that is eight, nine, nine, 8.5. 8.5. And what did you say to me right before we started? If you're at 8.5, where do you want to be? 8.6. 8 and, 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 and you said something, maybe you don't remember this. You said, I want to get better. I want to be better tomorrow than I am today. Every single person should want the same thing. We want it for ourselves. We want it for our spouse. We want it for our friends. We want it for our family. We want it for our kids. Everybody should be in that situation. And if they're not in that situation, if you if somebody says no, they're probably down here. They're probably exhibiting that sickness behavior. And we, if, like, I think once we know this, it's incumbent upon us that we have to grab grab them by the hand or grab them by the front of the collar if you have to, and say, listen, these are things that can actually help to get you out of that quagmire. One of the coolest things is that when this person who has no enjoyment for anything goes from here to here and feels normal again it opens up everything now they want to get more better and now they want to get more better and now they get to be at 8.5 and they want to be at 8.6 we see that thing happening and the more we can talk about it the more we can share it the more we can help other people do it because it's a big big problem and there aren't a lot of good solutions and I really appreciate you guys being here. I'm going to be outside to answer questions if you want them. Uh, but like I said, we recorded this. I hope we recorded this. Uh, we're going to post the video and, we're gonna, and the slides are already posted. So um, I know we have a couple minutes. Do you want to take a couple questions in here before we flip to the is, is that okay or do you want to do the questions out there? Okay. And so, and so just to respect everybody's time, when we hit the top of the hour, if you have to get up and go, get up and go. You won't, you won't.
ask you where you're going. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, go ahead and yeah. Yeah. Doing a lot of research. Why is the best time of day to take a probiotic? When is the best time of day to take a probiotic? It doesn't really matter. The more important thing is that you get it versus don't get it. But if you're following that idea of strain specificity, let's say that we're that we're interested in one of the one of the mood state um, the probiotics that I put up there, the depression one or the or the or the, or the stress one, you'd probably be best served taking that in the morning so you can get the benefits of that during the day, right? There are some the um, the one that's associated with GABA production that you could take that in the morning or you could take it at night because GABA production at night is to help you sleep better, right? And get into those deep stages of sleep. So there's some of that that can happen. But I just tell people, take it first thing in the morning, take it with your breakfast so that you don't forget. A lot of times those evening doses we forget or you know, we're someplace else and those sorts of things. So it doesn't really matter, okay? But look for the strain, strain specificity. And then my second question, I'm not sure if anyone has questions, but I have done between immunization and gut health? I knew someone was going to ask that. <laughs> um, next question? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very polarizing question. Um, so, I, so I'm going to answer it. And if you, if you, if you want to talk in more detail, we can talk in the hallway. Um, my kids have all been immunized. Um, I, I have all my immunized mumps, measles, rubella, like all of those kinds of things, there's some, so yes, you should get them. How you should get them is where the argument comes in, right? There are a lot of strategies about it. Could they be separated out? Is there a rationale for having too much of an immune system load all at once or spaced out over time? That's a legitimate argument to have. The yes or no is not a legitimate argument to have. Um, the one place where I will take an issue with immunizations is, um, is like flu vaccines. Right. Um, if you don't have to have them, maybe you don't need to take them. I travel to Southeast Asia a lot for the kind of work that I do. So if I'm in a pattern of going to that part of the world where those diseases originate, sometimes I will get them guys. Um, I haven't this year because I'm doing other things for my immune system and I'm, and I'm not traveling much like that. So we can talk for maybe a whole hour about this issue, but okay, sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we give we give them two supplements. One's called theanine. It's an amino acid that's 